It has always been the prosecution's case that Tony Tucker, Pat Tate and Craig Rolf were dead by 7pm. But a raft of evidence now indicates that may not be the case. Supporters of Steele and Wombs have put forward a compelling case corroborated by independent witnesses that shows the trio were probably still alive around midnight. Independently, the witnesses are not that convincing, but when all parts of the jigsaw are put in place, they are very hard to ignore. Three days after the murders, Rebecca Carr, or Carter, she either changed her name at some stage or um, there's a typing error in the paperwork, was seen by police after she reported seeing a Range Rover near Rettenden on the night of the murders. Rebecca did make two further statements in which she uh, eventually said that it was um, quarter to six when she uh, saw the Range Rover. So let's be generous and give her from between half four and 6pm, she said she saw the Range Rover. Rebecca said that she remembered the Rettenden Turnpike. She wanted to go in the middle lane to go straight on. She was stopped by the lights. In a lane, she had two vehicles ahead of her. Beside her on the offside was a dark-coloured Range Rover slightly ahead of her. In front of the Range Rover, there was a vehicle she could not describe, and in front of that was a white Ford Sierra. So you've got the Range Rover, a car she can't remember, and then the white Ford Sierra. The Range Rover had three people in it. She could not see the driver clearly, but the person in the front passenger seat was very large, muscular, broad built, and a big man. In the back and in the middle, leaning slightly forward talking to the driver and passenger, there was a person with a similar build to the front passenger who struck her as massive, his whole head, body and shoulders. He had dark brown hair, she saw him from the waist upwards and the arms. He was wearing a bluey green jacket. The street lighting was amber yellow. There was also the reflection of the lights from the vehicles. Those three were in her view for about a minute and a half while that vehicle and hers were stopped at the lights. She reckons they were about four yards away. She was shown photographs of the two men by police officers and she recognised both. The dark-haired photograph was the one in the back, Patrick Tate. The other photograph was the front passenger, Tony Tucker. As to the Sierra occupants, she said there were possibly three. The front passenger was very big and seemed to fill up the whole front seat. He had a big face. She could not see the face of the driver or the one in the back of the vehicle. She then goes on to describe the vehicle's movements. It drove off very quickly and then it turned right and the Range Rover followed it. Both vehicles, the Sierra and the Range Rover, end up going into Whitehouse Farm. She said there were Christmas trees around the fence. She said both the Sierra and the Range Rover swung in circles, the Sierra wider than the Range Rover. Both stopped, parked with lights on facing the road. Her thoughts about the occupants were that they had an odd appearance to be going to buy Christmas trees that early. It wasn't that early. 6th of December, it's only three weeks to Christmas. Um, she said the road conditions were very cold. There'd been some snow flurries on the turnpike. She said she heard the news of the murder, reported, and it bothered her all evening. And she found the police and they took her statements. So just to recap, here we have a witness, a geography teacher no less, so a person of integrity, with no reason to lie. She says that she saw, picked out Tucker and Tate's photographs, identifying them as two men in the car she had seen. Convincing stuff. Absolutely convincing. But there's more. On the 8th of May 2022, yes, this year, we were treated to the rather dramatic claim in the Daily Express, it's in a newspaper, so it must be true, right? That not one, but two pub landlords saw the three victims with a mystery fourth man an hour after they were supposed to have been killed. So two landlords, C. Tucker, Tate and Rolf, an hour after they're supposed to be dead. According to John Austin, the journalist who wrote the article, Essex Police did not interview the pub landlord or investigate in the sightings further, despite its potential significance. So he's saying they did nothing. In fairness to Mr Austin, he does go on to say his information came from a team of ex-Met police detectives who have chosen to review the Essex Boy murders. The article goes on. The detectives 
of being given access to defence case files and have also used their own contacts and knowledge. Amongst defence files, the team found details of the alleged sighting of the three victims with another unnamed man who the licensee knew. One of these ex-detectives is quoted as saying, On December 15th, 1995, a call was received by the Rettendon Murder Squad from the licensee of the Fortune of War pub in Basildon, stating, At about 8pm on the night of the murders, all three victims were in the pub with another male well known to the landlord. An action was raised for a detective to make inquiries with the landlord to establish the facts, but there is no record of this ever being carried out or any statement from the landlord. This inquiry may have proved they were alive after 6.59, the time the Crown say they were murdered. The Fortuna War pub was demolished in 2003 and it is understood the licensee in question has died. The other pub the trio was seen in, allegedly, was the Orsic Cock. It is nine miles away from the Fortune of War. Both landlords claim the trio were in their pub at 8pm, so one of them at least must be mistaken. It is a 15-minute drive from one pub to the other, so not impossible for about 8pm to apply. So if the landlord said oh, it was about 8, if they were there at quarter to or quarter past, you know, it's possible. So they could have been in the Fortune at War, quarter to eight, shot off and been in the Orsic Cock at eight o'clock. So plausible. These vital witnesses may have been able to prove that Tucker Tate and Rolf were alive after seven o'clock, the time the police allege they were murdered. If they're alive after seven o'clock, it would appear to support the claim by some that they were killed at around midnight as described by William George Jasper. So looking at this evidence, it gives credence or support to Billy Jasper's claim that they were murdered at midnight. That's how you read it in a paper. That's how you read it on the internet. That's why so many of you are convinced of their innocence, because this is how evidence has been revealed throughout this entire case. Drips and drabs and not quite all of it at once. So there you have it. Very convincing. If you read that, believe that, they couldn't have been killed at the time the police say. I think you may have guessed that I am not convinced in the slightest that Tucker Tate and Rolf were still alive by 7pm. But this is a prime example of how facts are manipulated to promote a false narrative. The very same journalist who wrote in the Daily Express that no action was taken by the police, later wrote on his very own website in an extended article that they actually did. And I quote, The detective visited and spoke to Barstaff and Mrs Johnston, that's the landlord's wife, who said they had not seen the victims there on the night, but that the landlord, Mr Johnson, was not there. They then added, Mr Johnson would phone if he had any further information. So the police did go into the pub. The landlord was out. They asked his wife and the bar staff who had been working that night about the sightings. They had no knowledge of seeing them. They denied seeing them. So then they did the normal thing. They agreed the landlord would bring the police if he had any further information. Job done. I don't get the problem. That's what happens every day in life. So, you know, more more to the point, where's the story? Police visit pub where nobody says they saw the murder victims. It's not going to get in the paper, is it? Bizarrely, the online article has quoted the landlord as saying that he had never contacted the police to say that they were in the pub that day. So he was unsure why the police were aware about his sighting to create the action log in question. So the landlord's saying, I've, not, I've never even wronged the police. Essex police just get better by the minute, don't they? They now appear able to invent a sighting of three people in a pub at a time they themselves claim the three people are dead. Even more miraculous, this invented story about the dead men being in the pub turns out to be true, and the landlord confirms they were there. How good are Essex police? Even the lunatics on those Essex Boy fan club pages wouldn't believe that. The landlord has spoken about his pub being frequented by villains, so it's more than probable 
He didn't want the fact he had rang the police about his customers being published in a national newspaper. There's your answer. OK, so let's get back to reality and uh, we'll do a little real detective work. We've got Rebecca Carr, or Carter, stating that Tucker Tate and the Range Rover, at least, were on or at the Rettendon Turnpike around 4.30pm and uh, we've been generous up until 6 o'clock, 6pm. The turnpike is eight and a half miles from Tate's house, 18 miles from Rolf's house, and nine and a half miles from Tucker's house. We then have the Orsic cock landlord, who says they were in his pub and left before six. He actually says they left as it was getting dark, so it could have been 4.30. But let's be generous and say um, between four and six. There are, there's two hours, all right? So... Here we go with the facts. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to break their day down into one hour slots. So between 1pm and 2pm. And this isn't what I think, this is what witnesses said on the day. Peter Cuthbert was an old friend of Tate's. He told police, the arrangement was made that I should meet Tony, Craig and Pat at the petrol garage next to the eastern garage, which is Barry Dorman's place, about midday. So I would give them the paying in book for the Range Rover. I arrived first at the garage and I had to wait a couple of minutes prior to them arriving in the Range Rover and I believe that Craig was driving. Right, just stop you there a minute. So they've arrived at the garage about midday. But throughout this video, I just want to make this point. It's important to remember that these are everyday Joes going about their business. If I asked you what you were doing at 2pm two weeks ago, it's more than likely you wouldn't have a clue. Likewise, with these timings, people think, my wife goes to work at 10 12, whatever time. So I remember I went out just after she left. So it was probably half past 10, 12, whatever. That's how people's minds work generally. Cuthbert is saying he had to meet them about midday. They are a few minutes late. No doubt they needed to sort out this paying in book. They then left in Pete's car. They didn't go in the Range Rover. They left that at the garage. And the reason that probably was is because the night before, Rolf had been pulled by the police and he was a disqualified driver. So he was no doubt only driving if he really had to. So whatever reason, they all get in Pete's motor. It's an 18-minute drive from Dorman's garage to TGI Fridays. That is where Cuthbert and the trio went, TGI Fridays. So around 1 o'clock, remember that? We're not saying definite, we're saying around 1 o'clock, took a tape roll from Cuthbert, arrive at TGI Fridays at Lakeside. And this is confirmed by another independent witness, the waitress Linda Wolf. She said, well, she went on to say they arrived around one, and then she said the four men left approximately one hour later, which would be about two o'clock, OK? So that she's saying they left about two o'clock. We do know that en route back to Barry Dorman's garage and the Range Rover, they had to pick the Range Rover up, they did make a brief detour. Peter Cuthbert told the police... On the way back to dropping them back to the car, Tony asked me to call up Five Diamond Close, an address where he used to live and now lets out. He said he wanted to collect some rent. When he went there, Tony got no reply. So then they head off back to Barry Dorman's garage to pick up the Range Rover. He said when we arrived, Cuthbert sat down at the back of the shop, took a Tate and Rolf, went to the counter and had a conversation with the man behind the counter. Cuthbert don't know what it was about, but he was guessing it was about the HP on the Range Rover. Cuthbert says our business at the garage was finished sometime between three and four, after which we said our goodbyes. This is my point now about approximate time. Cuthbert recalls still being at Dorman's garage between three and four. However, Mark Harding, who worked at LT Carpets, a shop on Timberlog Lane, which is right next to Tate's house, later told police, took a Tate and Rolf arrived at my shop at approximately 1.32pm and took or paid an outstanding bill of 700 quid. So the carpet shop is a seven-minute drive from Barry Dorman's garage, so it's not far. Wolf and Cuthbert are saying they were all in TGI Fridays between 1.30 and 2, so it's likely the carpet guy's mistaken. But for the purpose of this video, it really doesn't matter. Well, not just yet anyway, but there's an obvious conflict of timings, which is common when you're dealing with everyday Joe. So that's between one and two. They're meeting at Barry's, going to something to eat, coming back, 
paying a debt, trying to collect rent, and going back to the Range Rover. That's what they did in that era, roughly. So we move on. Between three and four, according to Craig Grove's partner, Donna, she left work at approximately 3 p.m. and went home. She told the police she was busy wrapping Christmas presents when Craig returned home with their daughter, Georgie. They were at home together for about an hour and a half, so let's call it 4.30. So, well, if he arrives just after three and they're doing it for an hour and a half, he was at home just after three till about half four. And according to Sarah Saunders, Tucker Tate and Rolf had all attended her mother's address after her car had broken down and Tate had attacked her. Now, some people think that was around 12. Some people think it was around three. But but it was that day, okay? So, between three and four, we've got Rolf at home, not with the other two. And the Range Rover's not with the other two either. It's with Rolf between three and four. Then we've got between four and five. According to PC Pullinger, who was based at Gray's police station, he said he saw Rolf, which had been just after he left home, at approximately 4.30. He said about 4.30 I was on duty in plain clothes in company with DC Williams in an unmarked police vehicle. I left Gray's police station. As I did so, I saw a blue Range Rover, which was travelling in front of my vehicle. I was aware that Craig Rolf was the user of this vehicle. The vehicle parked in Brook Road, adjacent to the front of the police station. I parked my vehicle behind it. I got out of my vehicle, and as I did so, the driver and sole occupant of the Range Rover also got out. So at half four, Rolf was definitely on his own with that Range Rover. Tucker and Tate were not in that vehicle, and they were not with him at half past four. I recognised the driver to be a person who I know to be Craig Rolf. I called out to Rolf and had a conversation with him regarding a future appointment. So there he is, half four, on his own, with the Range Rover, no questions, right? So we move on. Between five and six, according to Barry Dorman, he left his garage forecourt between five and 5.30 as he was going to play um, squash with his friend Keith Moore. A Dorman's employee, Mick Stenning, thought Dorman left around 4.30. So Dorman saying 5, 5.30, Mick Stenning, who worked for him, saying R4. He said... Um, En route to Squash, Dorman received a phone call from Mick Stenning. He said that Herc, which was Dorman's pet name for Tate, i.e. short for Hercules, had arrived at the car front to collect a Volkswagen Passat. Stenning thinks this conversation took place at approximately 4.50. Tate then came on the phone, spoke to Dorman. He said he would still take the vehicle, even though he didn't need it, as he'd fallen out with Sarah Saunders. He was going to get this car for her and he'd fallen out with her and went... Fuck it, I'll still, I'll still take it. Uh, Dorman said, you don't have to take it, but Tate insisted he would. He told Dorman he would pay him for the vehicle in the morning as he had a lump of money coming. As a result, Dorman agreed to Pat taking the vehicle that night, and so he did. So, between four and five, Tate's on his own, not with Tucker, not with Rolf, not with a Range Rover, picking up a Volkswagen Passat from Barry Dorman's garage. So we move on. Between five and six, Tate is definitely at home, Gordon Road, a quarter past five, because he called Claire Carey's mother from his landline. Craig Rolf wanted his partner Donna to have something new to wear for a meal later that evening, and so he took her to Lakeside Shopping Centre at 17.45. Not with Tucker, not with Tate, in the Range Rover, just him and his missus. He left Donna and said he was going to pick Tony Tucker up. This is at quarter to six. At approximately 6pm, Rolf picked Tucker up from his home in Fobbing. This was witnessed by Tony Tucker's partner, Anna Whitehead. So, Rolf, the Range Rover and Tucker are at Tucker's house at 6 o'clock. We know for a fact Tate wasn't there because he was at home, Gordon Road, and at 6 minutes past 6, he telephoned Claire Carey's mother and phone records confirm this time. He had a conversation with her about Claire coming to his house. At approximately 6.10, 6.15, whatever, Rolf picks Tate up from his home in Gordon Road and they travel to Basildon Tyre Services. We know that Tucker, Tate and Rolf were together in the Range Rover at this time because one of the workers there, Andrew Reynolds, made a statement in which he said the following. At six o'clock, the garage closed and I left the polo on the forecourt with the keys in as arranged with Pat. I drove onto Crane Close along Cranes Farm Road, as I got to the roundabout, the time was only about five past six. I saw a blue Range Rover, which I recognised as one Craig, Tony and Pat used. I knew it was them and their Range Rover, 
As I had seen them with it on several occasions, I could clearly see Craig was driving. Tony was in the front passenger seat and there was a stocky male between the seats at the back and I took this to be Pat. So there they are. They're near the tyre place in the Range Rover about 10 past six, say. So there you have it. You can forget the evidence of Rebecca Carr because no way were those three people together between half past four and we've given a bit of uh, leave room and six o'clock. No way. And you can also forget the pub landlord citing them three together in his pub between 4.30 and 6. It could not have happened that day. And R4, the landlord saying he saw them, we, we know Rolf was either leaving home or at Gray's police station at that time because the police saw him. Tate was at Barry Dorman's garage picking up the Passat and Tucker was at home. So, sorry, they're mistaken. Doesn't mean they're liars. Doesn't mean they're bad people. That There's actually... Um, a phrase for these people. These ghost sightings, as the police call them, are not uncommon. The people reporting, as I've said, are not liars. They are, for whatever reason, simply mistaken. Look at the case of Ricky Neve. Ricky was last seen leaving school at around nine o'clock on Monday, November the 28th, 1994, from his home in Peterborough. Some time after this, 13-year-old James Watson murdered Ricky, stripped him and left his naked body with legs and arms outstretched in a star shape. Watson then discarded the boys' clothes in a nearby wheelie bin. Forget Rebecca Carr Carter and two landlords. In Ricky Neve's case, 30, 3 zero, 30 witnesses said they saw Ricky after the young boy had already been killed and left in the woods. And these ghost sightings in Ricky's case were a real concern for the prosecution, despite expert evidence showing none of them, none of them were right. What they said they saw never happened. But the prosecution feared that a jury may believe that the ghost sightings were real. Prosecutors later describe in a TV documentary, it's called 24 Hours in Police Custody, watch it, it's really good, how they had to make the jury believe that Ricky was dead by around 12 o'clock and that he went into the woods with James Watson. But prosecutors believe that simple fact was obscured because of multiple reported sightings of the little boy. This could have derailed the evidence about the day Ricky was murdered, as witnesses claimed to have seen him alive later in the afternoon. Prosecutors believed that if a jury believed just one of those witnesses had been correct, it would have been the end of the case. These sightings were eventually ruled out because the witnesses had claimed Ricky was wearing his red jumper, which was not found with his discarded clothes. His jumper was actually found at home. But a photograph of Ricky wearing his red school jumper had been used on a missing poster which had been issued by the police. And the people who believed they saw him had got that image from that poster. That is also the case for the pub landlord, Rebecca Carr Carter, and the three witnesses who claimed, albeit 11 years later, that they saw the Range Rover around midnight. These are simply ghost sightings, as the police call them. Nothing more, nothing less. 